Okay, Matt. You are on mute if you're talking. Hello. Hello. All right. Um, can you make me a co-host? I'm getting ready to do that right now. Yes. And then also do not allow permit participants to unmute themselves. Let's uncheck that. Um, mute participants on entry, yes. Yes, okay. All right, the other thing is, which Luke, nobody asked me if, nobody answered me as to whether or not it was okay to do this, but I'm totally doing it because it's the right thing to do, which is I'm gonna enable closed captioning. No, no, no. Oh yeah, you, you should just always just do that. Yeah. Why, why is it not giving me the option to do it just automatically? I signed up for it to be automatic, um, but it says assign someone to type or use a third party CC service. Where is the automatic function, which I already set up? Huh. Dang it. I don't know. It should be there. It should be here, right? I'm not crazy. Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> What the heck? Um, I did. I just set it up. I just set it up to go, and I, I can't edit this, can I? Did, oh, did you did you set it up before you set up the meeting or after you set up the meeting? After I set up, well, no, I set up the meeting, and then I went back and I edited the meeting, and said I want to have closed captioning. Oh. I don't know. Uh, I wonder. No, there's no option to do it here. No, I put. I had to put it on the account. It wasn't a thing that you could edit actually in the meeting. Come to think of it. Right, but when, for for Zoom, sometimes if you do those account level changes, uh -huh. it won't change it for meetings that have already been created. But it did, though. That's what I'm saying. Like we didn't used to have this closed captioning option at all. Oh, well, then, then I don't know what to tell you. Then it seems like it's yeah, just Zoom it's being just weird. Yeah, being crazy weird. So I'm yeah. like, what, what? where is the option for automatic? That's what I want. But it's just not helping me at all. Well, then I guess we're not going to have closed captioning. Not this time. We will keep working. We tried. It was in my heart. It really was. Okay. Um, do you have the uh, run of show updated? I do. It, um, all right, I'm going to print off a final copy then. Okay. Uh, I mean, I can, there, I can reduce this to one page. There, there really wasn't anything. <laughs> it's just, just add the one extra person, which you're, you're doing a spotlighting anyway, right? Uh, sure. I, I hadn't thought that through at all, but sure. Yes, I can do that. Okay. All right. So it's bigger. I think I need to turn myself around. Okay. All right. So let's try checking out my background. Here goes Joe. That's it. All right, I'll be right back. I'll walk over to my printer and get, get this. Okay. Welcome, Joe. Okay, Joe, you are a co-host, so you can unmute yourself. Lou is coming in just a second. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm uh, slightly irritated because Zoom is not behaving itself. Hello, Lou. You're a big red blob right this minute. There you are. Hold on, hold on. I'm getting ready to make you a co-host. Okay, now you should be able to unmute yourself. Who, who are you calling a big red blob? <laughs> Joe, who's the hell you talking to? I presume she was talking to me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? All right, so. Um, how's, my, how's my lighting, Tamara? Uh, it's okay. Just okay, right? 
Yeah. Any more on this side? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. you're shadowed on one side. I mean, so I, I'm I'm got too much light on my face. It's a little annoying. I look very shiny, but oh well. I'm going to be. We just call it radiant. Radiant. <laughs> Who let? Okay, I'm sorry, uh, um, Adrian. I'm sending you back to the waiting room because we're not quite open yet. <laughs> Okay, we're huh? not letting people in, guys. We're letting it, people... says, it says the host is not allowing participants to unmute themselves. That's correct. Please don't that change that setting. Leave that just the way it Should is. Should I just press OK? Yes. OK. And please do not admit people. I didn't admit. OK, somebody admitted Adrian. Joe did. Joe, Joe stop admitting no, people. No, I did not. I did not. Joe, I saw that. Joe do it. OK, somebody let him in. No, he's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're admitting people at 11. You guys are smart. They can let themselves in. <laughs> Space people, man. 1158 is when we're letting people in, except for the folks who have to be on camera. Okay, so let me just tell Adrian apologies. Where's Matt? Matt in the background? Matt is, Matt had to go do something in background, so he'll be back in a second. Okay. It's a good question. How'd that person get in, though? I didn't let him in. Right. Yeah, and neither. One of us it is interesting. something. Well, I think you did it then. Let's, let's, let's blame everybody. <laughs> what the hell's the difference? Um, Tamara, is the lighting a little better? Yes, it is. So, I'm all shadowy on one side because my... Bleh. Oh, that's what happened, huh? Okay. All right, so... Um, so the new guy that you invited, uh, Joe, Brian? Yeah, so we, we, Lou and I discussed, I'm sorry, I, th I was meant to send you an email. I didn't, I, I'm not sure if I did or not. Lou and I discussed it. We're going to feature him in the Q&A part, um, not as an actual panelist. Yes. Okay. Sorry, you guys mind if I do a quick sound check on this video here? Yes, please. Meanwhile, I'm admitting Will. All right, can we hear it? Bored? You don't need to be. Good. Not right. sure which one to buy? Dio. Yeah, great. All set. You know, he, um, I, I know I say this often, but he had a film entered in the Hamptons Film Festival this year. Will? Yeah. No, not Will. Uh, oh, Gio. Gio. The guy you see That's in the right. video, the guy who produced our video. Cool. Well, you know, for, for a while, he was a video producer for WWE, and they sent him, like, all around the world doing stuff. So, pretty cool. He's a talented guy. Matt, you only know talented people. <laughs> You're a talent yourself. Hello, Will. This is Tamara, and I just made you a co-host so that you have the ability to unmute yourself. You are not, your sound, however, is not yet connected. Morning, Will. Yeah, no sound yet. Here he comes. Okay, Will, you have the ability to unmute yourself because you are a co-host. And so welcome. Email, make sure nobody's trying to get in. Okay. There's Will. Hey, hey Will. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How are Good you? Morning. How are you? Excellent. No major complaints. Well, good to see you. There's a lot of distance between no major complaints and excellent. <laughs> yes, it's uh, <laughs> it's 
<laughs> hopefully we'll get hopefully we'll get three downs to get there <laughs> nice all right <laughs> no no major complaints is when it's like yeah yeah my I, my arthritis hurts my arm but i'm not going to tell you you know okay i'll take the middle ground oh, exactly. yeah, I was gonna I'm, say, I'm in between there somewhere between okay so you're at second down gotcha okay well uh let me introduce you to joe fargnoli joe's the founder of new york space alliance will griffin is the chief ethics officer of course of hypergiant I don't think you guys know each other. Hello, Joe. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. And Will, I think you know Tamara from your, our podcast. Yep. Hello. Tamara Bond. Well, I don't think we actually met. I think we exchanged emails and so. Yeah, I mean, I just remember seeing your name on it. Yeah. On the of emails. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. So it's good to meet you. Actually, well, good to meet you virtually. How's that? <laughs> Great. How is? Yeah, where is everybody? I'm upstate New York-ish, you know. Um, well, I think you're in New York. Are you in New York? Yeah, no, I'm in Austin. Austin. Austin, Texas. Okay. Okay. So yeah. I'm from New York City. I'm from Brooklyn. Oh, okay. And so Brooklyn. basically, what part of Brooklyn? Flatbush. All right. I lived at 422 uh, Park Place at one point. Get out. Okay. Nope. The section, the section that I lived, I I lived, grew up in, is now called Prospect Leopards Gardens, right? Right. What used to be the D train, Prospect yeah. Park Station stop, the, the Lincoln yeah. Minute Road stop, actually. So. Yeah. No, I used to go to Prospect Park all the time. Yeah. Uh, Brooklyn Public Library was my yeah, spot. Exactly. <laughs> I just took my Brooklyn Public Library background down. Anyway. <laughs> uh it's it's honestly i mean i've seen nice libraries but that's a really it's really gorgeous. nice library it's gorgeous it's absolutely yeah. stunning so yeah, yeah so, but i'm now upstate in dutchess county and um oh dutchess county yeah nice. everybody says that's not really upstate but you know, we're well, joe upstate. you're coming to rochester new york where i am <laughs> oh yeah no you're <laughs> you're upstate yeah. <laughs> Actually, That's I grew up. I grew up up there. Yeah, oh, you did? Where, where are you from? Originally from where Joe is in the Finger Lakes region, upstate New York. Very small okay. town called the uh, Lions, New York. But I, I'm in Manhattan now. Live in Manhattan. Been here for uh, 30 years or so. Nice. So uh, yeah. Cool. And then and Matt. Oh, and actually, who's producing here behind the scenes? He's uh, with us. He's down in Florida today. Oh, nice. Based Where in Florida? Florida. Uh, I live in a town called Babcock Ranch, which is kind of near Fort Myers. Oh, yeah. Okay. So. Nice. Will, you're from New York originally? I forget. No, I'm from Austin originally. So I, I moved away for a long time, but I've been back here for, you know, 15 years. Right. Hey, Tamara. Yes. Uh, Robert is not where he's supposed to be is there yeah, a way you... i'm i'm pinging him right this minute okay yep. Lou, that was a very provocative title thank you that these, these guys kind of fought me on it we but i knew you'd like tooth it. and nail what do you mean unethical what do you mean by this yeah i knew we would like it yeah, very, very provocative. Usually people start with ethics as an afterthought. And I like the title because it puts the burden of proof on everybody who's pro space to explain what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we actually right. tried to get John Markoff, who wrote The Machines of Loving Grace. Yeah. Uh, to, to do this. But, you know, he said, you know, I, I wrote the book five or six years ago. And it's everything that I know is now sort of out of out of date. I would not have much to contribute on the ethics side of this. Oh wow! Which I said that's not true, but he was insistent. Mr. Cardillo, you have just been made a co-host, so you can now unmute yourself whenever you want. Wow! Well, look at all that power. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, Robert, Robert. It's Lou Zaccarella. Good to see you. Greetings. Greetings. Joseph, thanks for joining. You passed the first uh, ethics test of being able to distinguish uh, uh, Google Meet from Zoom. So sorry for the confusion I created there. 
no, no, <laughs> this is this is why we do this a few minutes early. All good. Exactly. Robert, we've got Will Griffin with us. I don't know if you two guys know each other. Will is uh, yep. with, with Hypergiant down in Austin, Texas. Great. And Robert Cardillo is with Planet Federal. Nice to meet you, Will. Hey, nice to meet you, Robert. Robert, where are you today? Uh, Alexandria, Virginia, just outside nice. of D.C. Yeah. Yep, I know it well. I like I like that town, too. Uh, my wife went to Georgetown, so we used to go into Alexandria. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a grad as well. Alexandria's great. Got nice oh, from there. Georgetown? Uh, my master's is from Georgetown, yeah. Nice. Yeah, no, we love Georgetown. It's, it's a small campus, but it's nice, and um, it's a great walk to Georgetown. This is awesome. Yeah, you're a Hoya. And then what's that bridge, the Key Bridge? It is. Key yeah. Bridge feeds right into the heart of Georgetown. Yeah. 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 We used to walk across Key Bridge. They, there was a, was there a mall over there? I don't know why we were going over there. Yeah. Right at the corner of M and Wisconsin was, it's, I think it's still there. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that's the George, yeah, Georgetown Park Mall. Yeah. We used to go down there for sure. But I think when we cross, I don't know why we were crossing the bridge to go into, um, it was Alexandria, right? No, that's that's Roslyn on the other oh, side. Oh, Roslyn. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay, just very quickly, it is uh, eleven fifty-seven. Um, we're just now starting to see guests arriving, um, and you all have co-host abilities. So that means that you should be able to uh, mute and unmute as you need to. Um, we will be asking you to go. Uh, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but we want everybody to be off camera until we're ready to, uh, until it's time for you to speak. We will spotlight you when you come on camera. Um, I'm going to pause. Matt, do we have, do they have to be off camera? Yeah, <laughs> no, Matt, no, they can, no, they can leave the cameras on. They can um, leave the cameras on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're okay. going to, we're going to spotlight them when it's time. Um, when, when it's a segment that you're and if it's during the panel discussion, something like that, please leave the camera on the whole time. In fact, because um, we might, you know, occasionally show a shot of, you know, everyone on the panel at the same time to get reaction shots and things like that. So, you know, during the actual panel discussion portion of this, treat this as though you were sitting on a stage. Um, so just, you know, it'd be, be on camera the whole time. If obviously if you need to get up and grab a drink of water or something, you can shut your camera off momentarily, of course, but uh, we'd prefer if you kept them on as much as possible. How about audio, Matt? Um, you can, you, you know, if you need to mute yourself, please do so. Um, you know, just be be cognizant of that. And so you unmute yourself before you start talking again, if, if you uh, put yourself on mute. Okay. Matt, you can show this opening slide now. It's 11.58. We should start letting folks in. So Robert, Will liked our title. How about you? And I'm letting people in. <laughs> okay. Thank you.
And so welcome everyone to our December New York Space Business Roundtable. This is the last in a series on ESG, Environment, Social and Governmental Factors in Space. We are talking today about the unethical future of space. Um, so we'll have some fun with that. Uh, we are, of course, in the holiday season. We kind of had a little bit of fun in the description. We called this Festivus. Um, anybody from the 90s might remember that. Um, so to kick things off, um, we're going to show a video that I hope you'll enjoy. But before we go into the video, what I'd like to make sure you're aware of is that you are muted. You will not be able to come off of mute, but you are welcome to use the chat function. The chat function is open to all. Um, and you are free to chat with each other, with us, as things go along. If you have questions for any of the panelists, please put them in the chat so that we can surface those questions as we go along. Um, our moderators, moderators, Joe and Lou, today can, can bring those forward. And so with that, I am very grateful that you are all here. And I'm going to say, roll the tape. Bored? You don't need to be. Not sure which one to buy? Be sure. Wonder if that person is the right one for you? Stop wondering. Introducing Mindset. It knows what you want, it knows who you want, and it helps you have it all. Faster and easier than you ever imagined. I didn't know I needed a new purse, but Mindset did. Mindset is a network of mind-reading satellites orbiting the Earth. They scan your brain, read your thoughts, and monitor your moods and desires. Then, Mindsat's advanced algorithms tell you exactly what to do. I almost ordered the kale salad, but Mindsat steered me towards the ham and cheese. Thanks, Mindsat. No more worrying about making the wrong choice. No more uncertainty. And boredom? It's a thing of the past. Mindsat told me he could never make me happy. Thanks, Mindsat. Installation is quick and easy. Our trained installers simply insert the Mindsat chip into your brain. Wait a minute. Satellites do a lot for you. They forecast your weather and deliver news and sports to your TV. Satellites help farmers grow more food, save lives at sea, and relieve disasters on land. They bring healing to the sick, education to millions, and the internet to billions. A day without satellites would be a day without computer networks, maps on your mobile phone, electric power, airplane flights, credit card transactions, and so much more but they can't get inside your brain and tell you what to do. So give a wave to your invisible friends high up in the sky. Every day, they make your life a whole lot better. It's a no-brainer. Satellite, the world's invisible, indispensable technology. Brought to you by the Society of Satellite Professionals International with the support from AVL Technologies, Crystal, and New Tech. I thought they could get inside my brain. I'm very disappointed to see that. Well, boredom hopefully is a thing of the past. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my dad used to say about a local business owner we knew, his heart would be in the right place if he knew where the right place was. Uh, well, in a Pew Research study on ethics, uh, those who thought leaders of tech companies do not sufficiently take responsibility for mistakes were far less likely to judge other aspects of their business positively than those who think they did take responsibility at least some of the time. Now that same dynamic in that study applied when the issue is whether these leaders cared about people like you or handle resources responsibly or provide fair and accurate information to the public by 42% to 88%. These are not surprising insights, uh, and these not surprising insights had little to do with whether these companies could, say, create a new flat panel antenna or autonomous vehicle that not only would not hit a single person if it swerved on a crowded street here in Manhattan, 
it would never be in a situation where it had to actually swerve on the street. They have a lot to do with the belief one of our speakers today uses to guide its business, which is ethics equals trust. Trust equals economic value creation. Trust. In 2011, China's one-child policy, which was certainly questionable ethically, since it favored the birth of males, had yielded a nation where a record 22 million men, 22 million guys were seeking uh, women uh, and were without them. A concerned government has since modified the policy, perhaps figuring that too much testosterone in a place where tech has driven down the need for human labor was not necessarily producing 25-year-old uh, monks, uh, more talented women, or space and satellite industry entrepreneurs. So ethical questions surround us constantly. They are the human land upon which our devices, for now at least, cannot tread. The space and satellite community is not new to this discussion, despite what many may think. Uh, since Norman Weiner, way back in 1950, wrote The Human Use of Human Beings, the topic of ethics has been at our table. So let's talk. Hello, everyone. It's the third Wednesday of the month, and we are back at the New York Space Business Roundtable. Thanks for joining us. I'm Lou Zaccarella of SSPI. We welcome you and especially our SSPI members and chapters around the world. Well, today we're going to finish the year with a topic that is in the back of our minds, but central to the thinking and the work product of our guests today, and that, of course, is ethics. Before we go over to the roundtable, I would like to thank the sponsor of this series this year, Luxembourg Trade and Investment in New York. And uh, Joe and I would like to give a special thanks to Mr. Franz Feot, the Minister of the Economy for Humanitarian Affairs, who was in New York last week and kindly hosted us for a wonderful dinner where we discussed this and other industry stuff. Um, we'd like to also shout out our media partner this year, uh, Space News Magazine. There it is. It's the awards issue. And senior editor Jason Rainbow for his work uh, on the series this year. This roundtable is also supported by World Teleport Association, the only nonprofit trade association on earth for the uplink and ground segment teleport operators. And also the Washington Space Roundtable and New Space New York. Well, Joe, today the E and ESG stands for ethics. So here we go. I'd like to welcome my colleague in this monthly journey, the founder of the New York Space Alliance, Mr. Joe Fargnoli, who will introduce our guests. What do you thanks, say, Lou. Joe? Yeah, thanks. Great topic today. Um, you know, the, the, the New York Space Business Roundtable is really um, targeting, looking at the hard questions that we need to face to really advance the space community. So today we want to look specifically at the ethics of AI and space and ask the question of whether AI is enabling human capacity or replacing it. And how much does this really matter when we're going to a place as different, dangerous, and vast as space? So we want to look at how artificial intelligence can be designed to help individuals contribute meaningfully to their communities and to society at large. We recognize that in the current digital economy, AI-driven software is often designed to incentivize individuals to become consumers of online content and passive recipients of goods and services. Against this backdrop, we want to look at what conditions must AI fulfill in order to allow people to conceptualize themselves as active protagonists of positive change. We know that answering this will require a deeper exploration of the business models and values which currently underpin AI technologies. To do that, we've assembled a team of experts here. I first wanna introduce uh, Will Griffin. Will is the Chief Ethics Officer for Hypergiant. Hypergiant, solves critical business problems using AI-powered custom solutions on their Hyperdrive science platform. Before Hypergiant, Will was the, a serial entrepreneur with uh, Griffin Media Ventures. He also worked with eUniverse Networks and News Corp before that, was an associate at McKinsey, and got his law degree from a little school up in Boston called the Harvard Law School. I also want to introduce uh, Robert Cardillo. 
Robert is currently the chairperson for both the United States Geospatial Foundation and chairman of the board for Planet Federal. He also serves on a number of other boards, too numerous to go through here. Robert was the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency from 2014 to 2019. And he was the deputy director for intelligence integration from 2010 to 2014, holds his PhD from St. Louis University, MS from Georgetown, and his BS from Cornell. So Will, Robert, as we kick off here, the kind of questions that are in my mind are about how we can ensure that algorithm outcomes and decisions are not tainted by prejudices of any kind. It leads us to ask, is prejudice inherent, uh, an inherent feature of human nature, or is it fed by educational and social structures? When we're using AI, how can we ensure that data is bias free? And how can we reshape societal structures and educational systems so as to reflect the oneness and diversity of humankind? I know that's kind of a really big question, but to open it up, maybe each of you could give a little introduction as to how you and your organizations currently or past have wrestled with these sorts of ethical issues as you both look to bring the uh, tools of artificial intelligence to the market. Maybe uh, Robert, you'd like to kick off. Uh, I'd be happy to. And first, let me thank you and uh, the society and uh, uh, everyone for having us on. It's uh, um, I'll keep expectations low. I don't know if we're going to solve everything in the next uh, few minutes here, but let's maybe at least, uh, maybe we can agree on what the right questions are, the challenges are going forward. And, and that's where I'm going to start, Joe, because I going to challenge is the way you framed the question. I, I believe, I can't wait to hear what Will has to say, but I believe it's, it's a losing proposition to start with uh, the objective being bias-free. I come, I come from a point of view that everything, including my vocalization of my thoughts right now, contains bias. It's my history, it's my education, it's my upbringing, it's, 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 it's how I had, uh, what I had for breakfast this morning. All of that is going into, you know, my point of view. And so I would pivot it just a little bit, Joe, and then I'll, I'll answer the question that I'm going to make up myself, which is, how do we how do we share the bias? How do we amplify and illuminate the bias so that as you're consuming, you can understand where that person, and I appreciate your question is about software, but let's face it, that software came from a person or a team, right? That also imbued the bias there. So, uh, so with that question, Joe, I'm I'm going to advocate for something I think we can, well, we'll see, I think we can agree with that, that transparency is a good thing. So, and, and, and again, you mentioned, you know, my current role at, at Planet, uh, transparency is one of the first words that comes to mind when we think about the company's value proposition with the idea being the more transparent, the better. Meaning if, if we can have shared views, and that doesn't mean shared understanding. It certainly doesn't mean shared agreement, but if we can at least share the view, we can advance the conversation to the point where we could find out, well, where do we agree and where do we disagree? And so um, uh, illumination, uh, transparency, visibility helps us move up uh, the complexity of whatever the, you know, the debate is about. And, and so I guess back, I'll, I'll finish with this thought, you know, with respect to the software, Joe, and, and by the way, you're not talking to a software engineer. I don't know how to do what I'm about to say, but the, the whole, I, you know, the, to the extent that we can get out of the black box, you know, with things coming in the left side and whatever analytics or insights or, or some sort of conclusions coming out the right side, I think is unhealthy. Even, even if it's quote, perfectly correct, right? Lou mentioned in his opening, people will not trust if they don't know what that transition was. And so whether this is explanatory AI or you know, illuminated AI, so you can at least put into English that Robert could understand what happened to the data uh, left to right, the better. So again, I'll, 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 I'll morph the question a little bit and, and then just double down on transparency. Thanks, Robert. Will, what's your take on it? So uh, I'm also not an engineer, although I work with them every day and I try as best I can to tell them more or less what to do. 
So I'm sure they would all say I pretend that I'm an engineer or I, I act like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, but what I am is a human being. Uh, and I started when I was in college, I studied anthropology and economics, um, which at least the way it was taught when I was an undergrad have a lot to do with each other. And I think especially as we start talking about space or we start talking about AI, uh, and I just want to say a little quick thing about our company so you can see where I'm coming from with these questions. You know, we deal with critical infrastructure, space and defense. Those are our three main categories. Now we do have entertainment clients and, and, and other, other businesses, but those are really our three focuses, defense, critical infrastructure and space. Um, these questions for us, while our clients and our use cases are very practical and technical, usually the things that we're working on, because they touch so many people, a lot of these questions are really existential, which is, what are we trying to accomplish with this technology? Uh, and usually in my role really in the company is to make sure that we keep ethics at the heart of it. And ethics as we look at it is, what are our duties to other human beings. Uh, and I always hearken back to, you know, really kind of my anthropological training, but also the way I look at the world, which is, is this good for people, bad for people? Why, why not? That's really kind of at the core of our questions and that's the core of ethics. If people are not involved, then ethics aren't implicated because ethics really are about our obligations to other people. If we're working on projects where people aren't involved, um, then we're probably not at the scale of trying to have the impact that we want to have. Uh, so when you ask these questions about biases or uh, are they inherent, uh, what happens with the technology, I kind of harken back to why did we create civilization in the first place uh, in the Mesopotamia region? Reason why is, is for survival. Uh, we were a nomadic people, you know, before that humanity was essentially a nomadic people. Uh, once population began to grow, uh, the competition for resources was too great and humans evolved to realize that cooperation was better than competition because it was necessary for survival. Once those first civilizations began in the Mesopotamia region, they came to an agreement. I usually call uh, several agreements, but I usually call these agreements a social compact. Uh, what's happening now with AI and technology is that core animating social compact of we come together to cooperate, to have civilization in order to survive, in order to enhance our quality of life, uh, in order to be fully human, those things are now being challenged uh, by technology. And that's true on Earth. That's before we even get to space. Uh, on Earth, technology is starting to, you know, and Robert makes a great point about transparency, but there are also issues of agency. There are also issues of autonomy. There's also the issues of technology and nudges uh, that are really getting at what does it mean to be human? And the lack of transparency inhibits our ability to form a social compact uh, because we don't know what the other side is trading. We don't know what their objectives are. And a lot of times humans are not even in the loop of this technology, which means that we can't have what, you know, Declaration of Independence would call um, consent of the governed because we don't even know uh, what it is that the technology is doing towards us. And then we certainly in, in we certainly don't even know the biases or motives of the people who are designing the technology. So we're big on transparency. Uh, we always start with what is the impact that the technology that we're creating, what will it have on people? Uh, and then what are our duties to the people, whether they know we're developing the technology or not? Uh, but no, I don't think you can eliminate biases. I don't think, I don't think that's possible. Uh, but what I think that we can do, and this is true from Mesopotamia to now, is every civilization or even every government is a conversation which is the conversation is here's what i need to survive here's what i need to thrive here's what i need to enjoy the way of life that i want to lead and then we will come together in a civilization and we will trade what i have of value to you 
and what my objectives are and what you have uh, that would be a value to me. And then we trade those things and we understand where we're coming from. And on that basis, we create a, a social compact that will keep us together. The fundamental social contract, well, right, that, that we've we've always heard. It, it gets changed a little bit now. I was, we were actually talking to John Markoff about coming on. He's the author of a book, Machines of Loving Grace. Yeah. A uh, beautiful book. He actually didn't think he'd written the book about five years ago. He didn't think that he was contemporary enough to actually be on here to talk with you guys about that. But when you think about his book, the subtitle is um, The Quest for Common Ground Between Humans and Robots. So he's talking about a social contract between the software or the machine or whatever you want to, however we want to define it, and us as the humans. So that is certainly paradigm shifting. Uh, at, at a significant degree, but I want to I want to just get a little bit more mundane with my questions for you two guys. Um, I hope they're not uh, too mundane, but but Will, uh, back to you, a, ch a chief ethics officer. That's a a new title, an unusual title, you know, historically I think in uh, in corporate in the corporate world. What what does a chief ethics officer do? Why, given your pedigree? Did you feel it was an important enough position entitled to take on? And then tell us a little bit about how you evaluate products mm -hmm. so that what you do, you know, has all of those elements that you just described. And then I'm going to move on to a, a similar question with Robert. Great. So I've been very fortunate in my career to work really kind of on first, I started in banking at Goldman. And I, it was during, you know, and we were in what was considered the hotshot group at the time, which was mortgage-backed securities, derivatives, collateralized mortgage obligations, asset-backed securities. So the financial engineering, this is my first job out of college, financial engineering was way ahead of policymakers. It was considered innovative at the time. Uh, now, as we all know, in retrospect, you know, 20 years after we started that group, it essentially blew up the global economy in 2008 because policymakers didn't know what we were doing. Um, so and then from there I went into entrepreneurship and then the way I got the hypergiant and I've been fortunate to have two very good CEOs here. The first was our founder, uh, Ben Lamb, and Ben is a serial entrepreneur and this is like his fifth company. And now he's already on his sixth company. But Ben Ben was like, Hey, come join us in some capacity. And we've been talking for years. And I hadn't done any, I never worked, you know, I went to law school, but I never even worked in compliance, honestly. You know, but Ben said, What do you think about ethics? And I was like, Well, I'm for them, you know, obviously, you know, I try to live my life in a, in a, in a way with right. integrity and I value relationships, but, you know, then I started to look into it. So then I went to places, you know, like the Harvard Berkman Center, who has the principal AI, the principal AI initiative, I went out to Stanford AI lab, sent to center for business ethics at Xavier and, and studied up. And what I realized is that ethics really will be the defining point between tech and public policy. And that is what will mediate what I call this new social compact. Uh, and then we you have a new CEO now, Mike Betzer, who's been very supportive of our work. And Mike also as a serial entrepreneur has been very successful. Uh, and he thinks, and you know, and I agree with him, that this is going to be a differentiator for our company because ultimately, uh, it will make our solutions more robust. So it's one thing to be innovative and then three years later, you blow up something like we did with mortgage back, back securities. And then now that innovation is lost. I think we saw that last year with facial recognition when the, during the George Floyd protest, when law enforcement used facial recognition to track protesters and the blowback was so great that IBM essentially got out of the facial recognition business. And there were computer engineers there who studied computer vision for 15 and 20 years. They were really an innovator in the space, but it blew up to the point where it wasn't worth it for them. And you saw Amazon and you saw uh, Microsoft with their moratoriums. Uh, so what Ben wanted and Mike continues to want at our company is to make sure the things that we create, especially because they're at scale and they touch so many people that they don't blow up. Uh, one, because we have a duty to society, but two, it's bad for business. I mean, I think, Lee, you, I mean, Lou, you put the construct up, which is that ethics, um, 
ethics ultimately leads equals trust and it's the trust that leads to the economic value creation right. so our philosophy goes like this is basically three main principles and it's based on Immanuel Kant's deontological principles uh the reason why uh we chose this approach is because it's about us and our duties to humanity irrespective of what the other players or our competitors are doing in the space so the step one and we analyze each use case based on this step one is is there goodwill is there a positive intent for the use case so our designers our developers our r d team on each use case they have to lay out the positive intent for the use case the second step is the categorical imperative which is the maxim which says that if every company in our industry every industry in the world used ai in the way that we are contemplating what would the world look like and would that world be desirable what that does for us is it requires us not to just look at our client or our partner uh, as our constituency but it requires us to think about the people who are touched by the technology it requires us to think in many cases all of humanity as our constituency that's what the maxim does and then the third step is the law of humanity are people being used as a means to an end in this use case or are people the primary beneficiary of this technology in this use case that's the designers and developers they all know in our company how to do this the second step is we take this what we consider to be some of the smartest contrarians in our company and usually they're not involved or working on this project or use case in their job similar to people who deal with red teams especially in cybersecurity. their job is to uh through each of those lanes of goodwill uh categorical imperative and humanity they're imagining all the things that could go wrong with this technology in the use case uh, once they put all their objections in, that file then goes back to the designers and the developers, and then they have to answer those objections. They have to say why the contemplated use case uh, does not raise those concerns or have those issues, or in a lot of cases, they modify their plan uh, for that use case so that it can solve those objections. Once we get that debate back and forth, it goes to the ethics review board and the ethics review board either accepts, rejects, or asks for modifications on the project. Right. It does not require me, the chief ethics officer, to be in that process. Once we already train um, our designers and developers on our method, then they can do it themselves. And then we keep it all in a use case archive. So then if you're working on a case for predictive maintenance, um, if you're working on whether it's a data science case, a facial recognition case, uh, neural neural network, natural language process, robot process automation, which is a big part of our business now, uh, you can go in before you even develop your tech solutions and see how we ethically reason previously previous existing use cases uh, in that particular domain, and then that helps you construct a solution uh, that meets our ethical framework. But that's just true at our company. Right. Every other company chief ethics officer means something different at yeah. so many different places because essentially it's a made up title. Right. Uh, but but fundamentally, it's not a made up process. It's it's something no. that you guys are working through. You know, I, what came to my mind, uh, Will and, and Robert now, it was <laughs> the canon law that the Catholic Church has put together through the centuries to guide ethics. I mean, it's 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 a similar thing in terms of structure. Everybody knows now you know, what they need to do when they're in uh, Hypergiant's case, when they're creating these incredibly powerful and sophisticated uh, AI and related products. Robert, um, you put up um, Planet's ethics statement and process. Now, um, I'm going to ask you, there are 12 areas or market sectors where Planet Federal provides services and makes an impact. And these range from, from agriculture to drought response. Um, you know, kind of picking up on what Will was saying, how he was describing how it works. Uh, tell us generally how you identify a market sector and uh, what impact you're anticipating for the end user when you go through that process. Um, yeah, thanks, Lou. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated question um, and 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 an ongoing one. Um, we like to say at Planet that. Um, 
while we're why we would love to pursue a solution you know an answer you know kind of an end state we also appreciate that life really is a journey <laughs> literally and figuratively and and so is so is this subject right i mean as soon as we as soon as we're quote sure right about our next step and and what's the implication we're we're surprised so uh so i'll give you a dynamic case that i'm dealing with now um um Planet, you know, uh, is now a 10 year old company. It's actually a one week old company as a publicly traded company because it was listed last week on the New York Stock Exchange. Congratulations. But, yeah. uh, well, thank you. I, I take little credit since I'm a very new, <laughs> new member. But, uh, but yes, the team, uh, the team should be celebrated. But, but th the ethos, you know, as we'll discuss, that, that formed the company to begin with was to try to share a view of our planet in a way that, that led to good, uh, that the people could make better choices. And better is obviously in the eye of the beholder and better depends on you know, what your objective is. But, but again, all things being equal, and they're not, but all things being equal, that, that better choices can be made. You asked about the business case. Uh, you, boy, there is tension then. Right, because a business case could, you know, lead to revenue, and revenue could lead to profit, and profit could lead to market share, and all those wonderful things from a, you know, fiduciary responsibility. Planet, and again, wasn't Robert's choice; it was the founder's choice. When they decided to go public, they went public as a public benefit corporation. All right, it was a choice they made that includes everything I just said: that fiduciary market and whatnot. And yet it, it enables Planet to hold on to that core ethos of good uh, that it began with. Now, as a one week old public company, obviously we've not figured out everything, but uh, let, me, let me pick one use case. I, I chair Planet Federal, right? So that's the, that's the component within Planet that deals with the federal government. And there's probably not a whole lot of controversy out of our contracts with departments of agriculture around the word, world. Oh, you want to increase uh, food yield. You want to have healthier and more sustainable agricultural you know, practices. Pretty much most humans can agree those are good things for humanity. Whatever, whatever as Will said, the local, local social compact is, it's a good thing if there's good nutrition, sustainable agriculture. There's another department in governments, they're called ministries of defense, right? And, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, our, our department of defense used to have a different name. It was called the Department of War at one point. So we all know that defense has two sides to the coin. Planet has contracts with ministries of defense and, and the Department of Defense. And Planet's now a 700 plus person company with an active ethics committee. Uh, we don't have a chief ethics officer. We have a chief impact officer, officer mm -hmm. Andrew Zoli. Andrew is your counterpart, Will, uh, at Planet. You, you guys, if you don't know one another, I'd, I'd love to introduce you because you'll have a lot to chat about. But, but back to your question, Lou, uh, we wrestle with the reality of, boy, that's, boy, that's a good revenue opportunity there with that uh, Defense Department or ministry over there. And yet, wait a minute, what could they do with that image, right, that might not comport with our, our humanitarian and, and goodness views? And uh, I just want to quote what I think is an immortal lyric from the uh, songwriter and singer Annie DeFranco. She finished one song with the line, uh, every tool is a weapon if you hold it right. You know, whether you think of that as a shovel or a matchstick or whatnot. Well, obviously, in, in Planet's case, it's the image. And can the image be used to secure and to protect and defend? Absolutely. Can it be misused, right? To do the opposite, of course. So, you know, Lou, that, that was a non-answer because I there, there isn't an answer to the, you know, how do you, there's no equation to figure out, you know, that's a market we're going to go for. You've got a set of principles that you, you you debate and you decide, and you evolve those over time. You apply them in each use case. And oh, by the way, as soon as you sign that contract, right? you begin to, to monitor, right? You you begin to learn and apply that learning going forward. So Right. Um, but the intentions, you know, I, I guess, Robert, the, both you and Will would say, even, even though you approach it differently, the intentions are always in the right direction. It's a question then of breaking down the, the ethical uh, notions to see, to see where you come out um, in the end. 
Yeah, of course. And, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, as I said earlier in my response to Joe, I, I think at least this member of planet is comfortable with the fact that we're not always going to land on the same, you know, outcome or decision space. What I like to say at planet is I want people to, 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 to participate in the debate and the discussion to, to ensure that we have a process that their voice is heard. Now, it, you know, Planet it, as a company is going to land on a decision and it may not comport with, you know, all those voices and it probably won't. But I think we're I think we're healthy if the voices that say didn't end up, you know, in in the decision space where the company landed, they don't leave, they stay. Meaning, look, I, I don't agree with the outcome, but I but I'm but I trust the process. There's that word again. And if mm -hmm. and if you can have that you can you i think you can continually grow because i think it's through that kind of shared experience and the shared perspectives that lead to at least an improvement of the path that will described earlier from mesopotamia on that by the way we're going to hand like a baton to our successors you know when they when they step into these roles yeah very good the nun who taught me sister mary pauline used to say they call religion a practice because we never get it right um joe over to you yeah, so I just want to build on something Will said about the, the financial engineering efforts that went on. Um, I'm sure no one said, hey, let's develop instruments that are going to take down the global economy. That was never the thought. The thought was, how do we create new instruments that could be profitable and hopefully create some good? Um, so I want to talk about sort of the unintended consequences that occur when we deal with very potent technologies. Specifically relevant to space, we're talking about this spooky ability for commercial companies to now have global access, not just to imagery, to collection across the uh, electromagnetic spectrum and other phenomenologies that is an awesome amount of new data that is also extremely timely and relevant. When we combine that with powerful AI algorithms and processing engines, I think you know humanity is kind of rightly concerned to say, hey, we're putting all, I mean, we're, not, we're putting all this power is ending up into the hands of private companies. And there's a fear that the regulation, the regulatory bodies globally are not able to keep up with the rate of innovation and entrepreneurship in the application of space and AI technologies. Um, you know, unfortunately, regulators usually are trying to catch up with these advanced technologies and make sure that you know no one is harmed and only good is done. And again, I don't think that Planet or Hypergiant are out to do anything but good, but unintended consequences do occur. So I think my question is how do you address the public to acknowledge the responsibility that you have as a, as a, a, a newer um, company that has a lot of potential power in your hands? How do we create an environment where there can be not only a self-regulation by each company, but also maybe an agreement as to a set of ethical standards that, that the commercial community itself can bring forward, as opposed to waiting for things to go wrong, hopefully they won't, but waiting for things to potentially go wrong, and then having government regulators have to come in. How do we manage our own you know, pickup game here, so to speak, before having things go to the point where we need outside regulation? It's a big question, but I think you know, for Planet, I could see it if they expand, and for Hypergiant, I can also see it. How do you guys, how, how would you guys make the general population comfortable, the investment community comfortable that this is not a party that's going to end at some point necessarily in a, in a bad way? So um, it's not a, just a tough question, it is the question. Because um, in almost there's we there really is no antecedent of a really innovative space where policymakers were ahead or even ever caught up until ex post after something blew up like that's just the reality. And I know when you talked about uh, you were being charitable about mortgage backed securities and asset backed securities saying it was unintended consequences. That's true, but it wasn't unforeseen. Um, it wasn't unknowable. I think, you know, Professor, the Nobel Prize winner physicist uh, Richard Feynman said, if it is uh, practically, if it's theoretically possible, it's practically inevitable, meaning that no one ever looked 
to imagine there was no red teaming going on. There wasn't um, what are the negative consequences that can happen if we get too many people in mortgages. There's a slight downturn in the economy. They can't afford it. And we've expanded more subprime mortgages at scale. Uh, it was foreseeable. Just no one was looking. Uh, it never was part of the process for us to examine what could go wrong because everybody was focused on what could go right. So you can see how that applies to AI. You can see how that applies to space. You can see how that applies to innovation. So because policymakers are going to be behind, then that relies on self-governance, essentially, for companies and self-governance for industries. Very difficult to pull off uh, for all of the reasons I think that Robert kind of alluded to, which is there's profit, there are profit goals, there are revenue goals, there are, uh, for designers and developers, there are creative goals, there are innovation goals, there are ambition. Uh, you know, if we look right now into the prime, prime movers in space, and at least this is what we see from our vantage point, because we do a lot of work with DOD, with Space Force, here are the prime movers. There's China, there's Russia, there's us. Uh, and that's military. Then there are the commercial actors. So what the general public hears about is they hear about Elon Musk, they hear about Jeff Bezos, uh, they hear about people going to space, $18 million for a ride to space. Je Bezos has the idea that he got from his principal, Professor O'Neill about space colonies, which would be these idyllic environments in space. So you can imagine everybody on earth looking up and saying, well, so what's gonna happen to us when you hop into space. Uh, and then we're in the face of uh, uh, unimaginable ambition. So if you can imagine, and a lot of analogies are always drawn with space exploration and the early explorers. Um, you know, there's a resource rationale for going there. There are all these benefits that are supposedly to come to the old world, which is Earth, from what we can discover in the new world, uh, which is space. And I'm troubled by that rationale because you now it used to be that King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella funded Christopher Columbus to go discover the new world in search of resources, essentially. Uh, now, fast forward, Elon Musk is King Ferdinand, Queen Isabella, and Christopher Columbus all in one. That's, that's the level of the ambition of an Elon Musk or a Bezos today. Like now they're trying to combine themselves into that those all of those entities who uh, led to exploration before into one person and there's never been a public statement that said um here are the ethics that we want to take into space here are the values that we want to take into space so that we can look back at earth and make it a better place so that's not even part of the discussion so now who can drive the discussion and what are we doing because you know we're we're a small company uh Federal is a little bigger than us, but in the grand scheme of things, still a growing, you know, emerging, you know, enterprise. But our clients and our partners are prime movers. Uh, and one of the things that we always try to do, at least when we talk to our clients, is the vetting that we, ethical vetting that we do, that's a self governance construct. That's what we believe our duties are to humanity. We're going to do that whether our client asks for it or not when we vet use cases. But oftentimes what happens is then our clients then, because everybody's trying to figure out this question of ethics and governance, they'll ask us about our process. And then we in turn, you know, show them our ethical vetting process. Well, we're doing that now, at least we feel, and I feel like the most impactful client in this area could be the Department of Defense. Because a lot of reasons, but because they believe in enduring values, uh, they're responsible for uh, preserving the way of life and and they also are in this geopolitical fight. So it's not just an AI fight with China. It's also a values fight. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with yeah. China. And the question yeah. is, uh, whose values uh, will win? And it's ultimately and we we talk about this and they talk about this, too. You know, it's it's we need to win in AI. Uh, not just to win in AI, we need our values to win through AI. And so I think that the Department of Defense has a tremendous capability to set the table 
uh, for values in ethics and AI, also set the table for ethics and AI in space. And the reason why I'm hopeful about it is because, and, and Robert alluded to this too, about how it used to be called the Department of War. And that transition to the Department of Defense happened after World War II. And James Forrestal, who became, who was a civilian, by the way, he worked in the military, but he was a civilian, became the first uh, secretary of the Department of Defense. Imagine what, now he had a tragic ending, but imagine what was on his plate. Desegregation of the military, formation of the United Nations, containment versus communism, um, in, in the Soviet Union. Now, how did, and, and he set in force, and Truman gets a lot of credit for this too, obviously, uh, but Forrestal was the first Secretary of Defense at the time. He set in motion a set of values that said that we have to live up to the creed of our founding documents in the way that we organize the Department of Defense in order for us to be successful against the Soviet Union. And ultimately it took 50 years, it's to Robert's point, this is not overnight. It's, you know, in, in the founders in their own vision set us on this course of a more perfect union. That sets a standard that says we never get to finality, but it's also a more perfect union. Lou alludes to Catholicism and Christianity. Our goal is to be more in this, not to turn people off, but ultimately if we're talking theology, it's to be more like Christ, not to be Christ. Like we're not going to be perfect. Same with uh, our founding documents. It's a more perfect union. We won't have a perfect or idyllic society, but it's our values that will allow us to win, even in innovative spaces. I would, I would argue, and I, I argue this every day, obviously, for a living, that innovation, it gives us a more of an opportunity to show off our values and deepen our values because it shows that our values are enduring they're not um they're 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 never outdated freedom's never outdated uh autonomy's never outdated ethics in in kindness and 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 fair trade never these principles are never outdated in each innovation allows us to demonstrate that but we have to keep it at the top of the mind because unintended consequences to me says you never considered ethics because now, now, it's well, all foreseeable. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. And I actually shouted there. I thought my mic was on mute when I was agreeing with you. Um, but but with Joe's question was, how do you keep government out of it? And 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 the riff was, I think, just spot on. Well, it, but it's not that we want to keep government out, Lou. I think it's but, how do we not necessitate that, right? How do we create civic level management of these right. issues so that we can and you, we don't have meltdowns we can self-contain as a community i'm not against the government it's just that how can we make sure that we're taking care of um you know the issues appropriately right and i and i think the the answers that we got joe were it, it's it's ultimately a values question it comes back to a values question um and, and by the way uh you know uh, ferdinand and isabella had values too i mean i'm going to go back to the to catholicism again they were exporting a religion, a faith that they thought should be predominant because it, it was intending to liberate people. So I think we have to be careful there when, when we self-govern to also be self-aware of that. I couldn't agree more though, Robert, that what we are trying to do uh, as an industry, and, and I think I'm paraphrasing well, is to also carry forward the values of, of democracy, of freedom, which lead to innovation, which, which naturally unveil themselves ethically and, and are, we believe, you know, for the long term. Does that matter if now publicly traded planet has a bad quarter? Wow, I wasn't ready for that, uh, Lou, but that's, <laughs> that's your job. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask I, that. I, I, no, um, you know, it, it's funny. It's it's like you've been inside the, you know, the planet blog room uh, for a while because there is a worry, right? I mean, there's obviously lots of uh, financial and, and potential investment benefits from going public, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a lot of worry about the quarter to quarter mentality of that too. And how will it change the company or could it change it? I mean, it will by definition change the company um, uh, because it, you know, will it, will it lose that long-term objective and the, that, that core value of goodness for humanity 
when you race to close, you know, each quarter with a number, right, to, in order to meet, you know, some some expectation. So I, I think, it, I mean, we're a week, we're a week into this, Lou, maybe I should come back to your broadcast, uh, you know, in a year or two, and you're always welcome. we should, you know we should check in. But, uh, but well, a couple things, though. Um, um, I'm going to, this is not a quote, this is a paraphrase, but Justice Brandeis is crest credited with 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 a phrase that goes something like sunlight is the best disinfectant for democracy lowercase right meaning meaning the more that 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 the people that are part of that social compact that will describe the more that they know and and even better that they share that understanding the better because then you can make an elevated decision. Doesn't mean you'll all agree. Doesn't mean you'll all be, you know, holding hands, you know, heading off to uh, to that endpoint. But it, 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 if you have that shared light, your 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 trust goes up, your confidence goes up, your 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 willingness to participate goes up, and as I said earlier, your willingness to continue to participate even when the outcome doesn't go your way. I don't wanna us, get us pivoted off on where our election kind of uh, uh, election confidence is these days, but let's face it, it's less uh, than it was uh, at one point. And this member of this society worries greatly about that because I actually think that the fundamental, you know, kind of the backbone of a democratic uh, lowercase d uh, society is the confidence in, in how we make choices. And if you lose that confidence, why participate? And then if you if you stop participating, maybe I'll work against this system, you know, and then you, you, you get into some very dark corners there. So coming back to your question, I, I appreciate on quarterly investments, uh, Lou, I don't know yet. Um, it is something that Planet is is well aware of that there is there is a risk that 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 you know very short term mentality could could negatively affect the long term goal. And I'll finish with this because because Will introduced Elon. I like to say, and by the way, a huge fan of of what Elon's done with respect to access to space and lowering of costs. But I believe Elon's doing that because he believes we're going to screw this planet up so much that we need to go somewhere else, right? And so he wants to colonize Mars. Now, you, you could agree or disagree with that, but, but I like to use that to, as a frame. Planet, the company, is, is trying to prove Elon wrong, okay? <laughs> Meaning if, if we make better decisions about the care and feeding and sustainability, we won't have to go to Mars. I mean... I'm, I guess I'm all for it being an option for those who want to do it, but we want to be able to let those who don't want to go be able to survive here. Sorry, Lou, for turning your quarterly investment report into an interplanetary answer. <laughs> well, I think that's where we're going, Robert, and I think it's, it's perfectly fine, and, and you're right. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to make it better here to, to kind of simplify it, um, but we're trying to figure out how to do it uh, within the context of this this new age of something else, you know, running alongside of human beings. And while at the same time, we still haven't, as I think, to quote both of you guys, we still haven't quite figured out how to be fully human. And so we got a bit, we got a challenge in front of us. And um, unfortunately, Joe, we have to end this segment here, I'm told, and then we're going to go to uh, audience questions. And uh, I know we've got a special guest that we brought in to be a guest moderator as well. So um, why don't we go to, to the next segment, Tamara, and then see where we, where we end up with our questions. Sure. Thanks, guys. As we move in, I just want to introduce a good friend of mine, Brian Cruzy. Brian is a futurist, a philosopher, an engineer, an entrepreneur, and he's been doing pioneering work in artificial intelligence applications for more than three decades. I can go through his long resume, but uh, Brian should be a great addition to our uh, Q&A session. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Joseph. <clears throat> I was also in the space industry for about 20 years too, as a space operations. So this is a great uh, um, uh, panel to be part of. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I do have a, uh, a question for both of you. Today, when we say AI, we really mean pretty much machine learning. And we talk about, uh, which is a statistical process, right? Pretty much. Um, 
and uh, we we've already applied it to a lot of areas. It's an extremely powerful tool, right? And people make tools to extend their power over nature and power over nature gives you power over other human beings. So the idea of ethics immediately comes into it. So this is a powerful tool. And so we need to ask these questions, you know, what are, what are the end results? But do you think it would be any different if machine learning and other statistical processes like that were never called AI in the first place? Or the fact that we call it AI, put a different perspective on it, and gets people to start asking different questions or seeing it from a vastly different perspective. Uh, for example, you mentioned John Markov and his book about uh, the relationship between machines and computers. Uh, I mean, between humans and computers, yes. But when you say that, you start thinking, oh, I'm thinking, oh, that's like the three laws of robotics, right? That Isaac Asimov had about the machines themselves are going to be making ethical decisions. And of course, machine learning isn't in that category and there's no path. So that's my question. Would this whole debate about ethics with AI be different if we just called it ethics in advanced statistical processing, large data basis? I, I wanna jump in quickly and completely agree. I, I have a problem with the term um, and I appreciate that it was born in the fifties. Uh, I think at Dartmouth and all that, and God bless, you know, those, those future thinkers, that, I guess your predecessors, Brian. Um, but, but I do think it gets in the way. Uh, I, it gets in the way of thinking through what, and I appreciate people, there's all sorts of categories now of AI, you know, narrow general and, and all that. But, but I like machine learning uh, and, and I use computer vision um, in my world because I deal with imagery a lot. And, and I used to run an imagery agency. And so I would just say, look, look, let, let the machines do what machines are really good at, which is comparing what was a one and zero today, which is now a zero and one tomorrow, right? I mean, something has flipped, something's changed. Let the computer do that kind of core level change detection, you know, physical change detection. The more interesting question and more valuable question that I want, I wanted my humans, my analysts to think about, why did that change? And, and what does it mean for human A, human B, or humanity, if it's big enough? And what does it portend for tomorrow? Eventually, perhaps, you know, the algorithms, the Asimov, you know, principles will be applied and computers will get good, if not better than us at that. But I, this this participant thinks we're a ways away from that. So I do think we, I think we could have a healthier conversation today if we if we kind of scaled it back to what it is. I think it's easier for people to get their heads around, and then I think you can have a more thoughtful dis discussion around the uh, you know the uses and limitations. Will you want to? Take I that think one? AI is a is a catch all marketing term. So obviously at that Dartmouth conference with John McCarthy and his colleagues, they essentially basically just came up with a catch-all term to, because when we're in our company, like I'm sure this is true with Robert, when we're working on use cases, we don't say AI. We talk about the use case itself, robot process automation, predictive maintenance, like whatever the use case is about, that's what we talk about. And then the AI are just, you know, the quote unquote AI are just a tapestry of techniques and tools um, that we use to try to solve the problems that are presented by that use case. So I agree with you. I think it's a catch all public marketing term. Now where the rubber meets the road is the general public or the governed who in our society, we want consent from, they don't think about it at all until something blows up. So they don't think about, uh, privacy or being in the cloud until there's a data breach and their credit cards everywhere. Uh, as the case in, in the UK, they don't really think about, you know, scanning their eyes or finger fingerprints until the biometric data um, is compromised. Uh, this will also be true. It's just like with nuclear weapons. We don't really, we didn't, we don't, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't know existed when the first bombs were dropped. And we really don't think about it until, uh, something happens or we're on the brink of a war and when i grew up we used to do nuclear war drills where you ran under the desk like we would have actual everybody remembers that you'd have actual drills for that and then you would think about it but you don't interact with it that's why i think it's important for professionals who work in this industry the is to ensure 
that the govern they don't have to think about and keep uh, say abreast of these issues. I always make the nuclear weapon analogy. Why have we not? Why has there not been another uh, nuclear weapon dropped? Because the effects were so devastating that it created a uh, a moral response from scientists, a regulatory response from um, governments, and an awareness of the potential for mutually assured destruction. Yeah, we continue to innovate on nuclear weapons and continue to innovate on nuclear technology, but we realize how devastating it is, which brings me to my final point, why I worry about space uh, and Elon Musk, because the first country that figures out how to get enough of the citizens that they want into space, it actually takes away a, a lever of mutually assured destruction. Because if I know that I can jetpack millions of my citizens uh, off of Earth, then that mutually assured destruction element goes away. Uh, because now I know that the people who I want to survive can't survive, which is the reason why we always, all, and, and this is why we always push, especially in, in the DOD context and the military and geopolitical context, we always, we always push um, the idea that we have to win with our values so that the governed, ours within our society, plus, and, I, and many of you probably remember the Cold War, the non-aligned movement, those others who are not our geopolitical competition also decide, I would rather live under these values uh, than live under other values. And then that continues to create the worldwide movement towards democracy and freedom. Those are inextricably linked. And I think when we go to space, as we go to space, as we compete into space, we have to take uh, the values there. It's, it's, it's crucial. Yeah. Uh, Brian, I want you to respond to that that last part, um, the unethical, that's the unethical use of space that we're talking about. I think uh, Will has defined it. Um, Joe, before we do that, though, we're going to put up a slide. Oh, now, I think. And we're going to tell everybody who's, because I know a lot of people have to leave it around one, uh, what's coming up uh, for the roundtable. And then we're going to go back to some questions that we've been getting here. Joey, you or me on this? I, I didn't come to the rehearsal. <laughs> Want me to do it? Yeah. Please. Okay. Well, um, every third Wednesday of the month, uh, Joe and I will, uh, New York Space Alliance and SSPI, will be bringing you these kinds of conversations. And uh, if you like this one, uh, hopefully you'll like the ones that we've got planned for you next year. Just to look ahead at the first quarter, um, we've got, um, we're going to start talking about the climate. So we'll have one on um, satellites boosting sustainable technologies on Jan January 19th. And then SPAC Crackle Pop, we're calling it on February 16th. We're going to be talking about SPAC fed space companies and the disaster that they may portend or not. And then on the 16th of March, we'll be talking about um, space financing. Um, and you can see uh, where we're going to be going with that one. So that's what the first quarter looks like. Uh, you know, We'd love to have you continue to join us. And uh, for those um, in the audience uh, who are interested on Friday at 1030 Eastern time, the December meeting of SSP WISE, that's our Women in Space Engineering Group, special interest group, uh, will take place. Um, if you are a woman in the industry and have not attended a WISE meeting but would like to, uh, SSPI would really like to welcome you to that. Uh, and you can learn more at sspi.org backslash events. And uh, Tamara Bond-Williams, our membership director who's with us today, can also tell you more. And that's been uh, the fastest growing uh, group uh, of SSPI, uh, faster growing than even our chapters in India and Canada and those places. So we're pleased with that. Joe, anything else to add before we go back to the questions? No, just we look forward to you guys joining us for this first quarter series. Again, we're trying to really tackle some hard hitting issues here, looking specifically at how we can get objective data from satellites on addressing this climate issue, reducing the, the air bars through looking at what satellite technology is over the horizon that should help us address this issue. 
in February, we're not trying to burst the bubble here, but we think that there's really some data that we need to look at relative to the use of SPACs in promoting the space industry. And then in March, we really want to host uh, st striving space entrepreneurs who are looking at ways of getting space financing. So the purpose of the roundtable is really to kind of ask these hard questions, make this a safe space, and uh, hopefully help this community to self-regulate itself towards a more sustainable and beneficial future. So we'd rather ask the hard questions here than on the other side of uh, you know, a cataclysmic event. Yeah, well said. Um, I, we just wanna finish up some of the questions that we have. Um, you know, Will, you got, you got everybody's attention um, with the reference to moving people out to space, which could uh, eliminate mutually assured destruction notions which have kept us from having a, an Armageddon uh, since, uh, since the first atomic bombs were dropped. Um, and I wanted to just get um, Brian's reaction to that. I think that, um, th that the social impact of humanity moving into space is, I, I agree with you, Will, it's totally huge. Uh, and you've compared it to, um, uh, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand financing Columbus, who discovered the New World, and you know that opened up the floodgates of everybody leaving Europe for every sort of reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I guess you one con you had several concerns. So one is, well, in one case, is it better for the government to open those floodgates, a government, or for a single individual? Because a single individual, you don't know what you don't know what they're about, really. So that the, they may or may not have be, be public spirited. But in the end, the question is not so much opening the floodgates. I think Elon Musk is opening the door. He's building the railroad to orbit, right? And everybody, once it's there, you know, will probably be able to use it unless he says, no, this is only going to be for me and my projects. And then the other question is, OK, so he puts people on Mars. Is he going to control what they do? Or, or again, or is he just opening up the door and let them go? Because I think the great impact of opening up the new world was that all kinds of different people came over there for different reasons to get out from under the regimes that they were living on. And so you saw every kind of experimentation, every kind of planned society, some worked well, some didn't. But in the end, it was usually empowering for individuals to, to live the way they wanted to live. And so in this country, we've actually had a foundation that says, look, people don't need to have a huge monolithic government over them telling them what they ought to do. And I think that was where we developed as a foundation in our own democratic values was that people, individual people generally, if left alone, will behave responsible and leave other people alone. Now, so to me, that's the great hope. And yeah, I mean, there are, you're, you're right to talk about the implications there. Uh, there, whatever a great opportunity arises there are opportunities to mess it up. So I, I think, I, I think well, it's so, wonderful yeah. that we're asking these kind of questions at this point. Well, Brian, I think there, there has never been any exploration without government anywhere, uh, including from the East Coast to the West Coast. There are land grants. There are all, always inducements. Um, and when we talk about the people coming to the new world, we, we have to remember that all people didn't get to the new world the same way. Uh, the majority of the people who came to the New World came as indentured ser servants and slaves. The majority. Uh, so they, so the ones who came voluntarily were making the choice between the frying pan and the fire, and they chose fire. Um, obviously, as we know, African Americans got here through slavery. The, it, the overwhelming majority of people who came with explorers came as servants. There's no question about that. Now, there in the late 18th century, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, there became a different class of immigrants who came kind of along the narrative that you outlined, which is like somewhat more voluntary, like looking after opportunity for opportunity. But before the 20th century, the majority of people who came here were indentured servants or slaves. And that was not just here, everywhere in the world, 
That's true for people who left India going east, who left, I mean, left Europe going east, who left Europe going south, who left Europe coming to the Western world. They were they were indentured servants or slaves. Um, and but they all were sanctioned by the government. Nobody, they, nobody just hopped on a hopped on a boat and said, let's see what's going on over here. Like that, that wasn't happening before uh, the early 20th century. When it comes to space, remember, Elon Musk only functions uh, because he ha has the blessing of the United States government. If the United States, that's why they can go to space. If the United States decided we don't want people to go to space, then that's the end of it. You know, Jeff Bezos won't go to space. Elon Musk won't go to space. So there'll be some government who opens up an exploration route uh, to go to Mars. And in a lot of cases, and this is what we have to be mindful of and in i'm pro spacex we we put four cubesats into space to the i you know to the iss through uh, we we jumped on um through spacex that's how we got our cubesats up there to the iss uh but at the same time that's a different role you know which is essentially an uber role that's a different role from setting up new colonies and that's going to require uh, government sanction and i can assure you that the the Department of Defense Space Force they have no interest at all in allowing any colonization of any place off of Earth that is not controlled or governed. Uh, it just you know it it just won't happen. Uh, well, just to um, extend that, how would the hypergiant um, ethical decision-making framework um, apply to a concern like that, to the, to the concerns that, that you've been raising and that we all know exist. We've all seen the expanse, right? We've done podcasts with our friend Cass Anvar. Mm -hmm. How would the framework handle a reality like that or, or something that you would anticipate as a reality? So, you know, so there's a whole bank of quotes that I usually always share that juxtapose uh, the resource rationale that, at least on the commercial side, you know, Elon Musk and and Jeff Bezos articulate for going into space, and and Joe alluded to it uh, to the point, which was that he thinks that Earth is going to either there's going to be a resource resource depletion issue, a Malthusian nightmare type scenario that will require us to go to space. So there's a resource rationale to go there, uh, and I juxtapose that against Christopher Columbus quotes from his diaries about why he was going from island to island, essentially to take possession and to find wealth and riches essentially for the Holy Roman Empire. Um, when, and so our first step is, is there a positive intent? Uh, if that rationale is a resource rationale, uh, that usually raises questions on what's going on in space. Now we have a bunch of use cases going right now that are space related. Now there are some that we're working on that you know are consistent with the IADC and space debris, and we can use machine learning in order to try to avoid objects hitting each other in space. And obviously, everybody in the world has an interest in that. And those are easily vetted use cases. Uh, and then there are some other use cases that are a little more complicated that I really can't talk about that have to do with national security. And those have to be vetted, and those are the tougher discussions because sometimes they're just two bad choices. It's like between bad and awful. You know, it's kind of what I talked about, about indentured servitude. I can either be an indentured servant and starve in Europe, or I can be an indentured servant and be at least be able to grow my own food in the new world and eat. That was essentially choice. Well, anyway, sometimes in a national security context, we are dealing with two very, you know, bad and worse, you know, situations. And those are really tough to vet. But then they then we get back to that's when that's when we have to really fall on our enduring values. So when survival is at stake, the question is. It's either us or them, you know, and especially in a, a lot of space and Brian, you know, this too, like most of space is defense. Most of what we're worried about in space, it's not the communication satellites, which we do worry about. It's not commercial. 
uh, it's not whether you get your text messages fast or if you can transmit video. That's not most of what we're worried about. What we're really worried about is China's Baidu navigation system and companies signing up for an alternative to GPS where now they have control over time and space on Earth. Like those are the versus our GPS system that we want everyone to stay on. Like those are the questions that we really battle. So our use cases start asking these questions, you know, how do we ensure that we can use our values to win these geopolitical fights um, with emerging technology? So when in doubt, always refer back to the core values. Well, in our case, for a lot of our customers, it always yeah. goes back to the Constitution. Yeah. And then right. in some cases, um, in, in some cases, you know, we will elevate to UN Declaration of Human Rights, the Geneva Convention. Sometimes those things are implicated. It's sometimes all the way back to the Magna Carta. But yeah, it's it's really to hold on to those values because everybody on this call, and I think Lou alluded to it, we're going we're gonna to be gone. Like, you know, I mean, there's some younger people on the call, but, you know, we're, we're on the other half of everything. It's now, what are we leaving our kids? Now, our parents didn't leave us technology. That wasn't their legacy for us. Uh, their legacy for us was, you know, our relationships, our values. Uh, and because the technology that they would have left us is already outdated. Uh, we can't leave today's technology. That's not really what we're leaving to our, right. our kids of future generations. What we're leaving to is when we were faced with hard questions, Here's how we use our enduring values to answer those questions. And we always kept our relationships with each other in mind. And the way they'll appreciate it is we always kept you in mind. And you can go back to the Constitution and the Constitution talks about us today. In, in the documents, they were all forward looking. Obviously, if, if it's what, you know, Frederick Douglass had a great speech at one point he said what to the slave is the fourth of july obviously that document didn't mean as much to slaves at that time didn't mean as much to women at that time but the values were enduring they right. handed that down so it's the same today like we have to hold on to the values even for the people that we're not doing a good job of of pulling under that ambit of those values right because as we move towards a more perfect union as we go into the future They'll have that and then they can build on that and and hopefully they can make a better civilization than we've been able to make today. Exactly. Yeah. And and you 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 took the phrase I was gonna say, the more perfect union, the aspirational aspect of it. Bryant had alluded to it as well. We yeah, have to Brian, keep, we have great to, points about it. We have to keep going there. Uh the other side of it is, you know, Doug Larson's line, instead of giving a politician the keys to the city, just change the locks. That'll take care <laughs> of it. We don't want to go there, uh, Joe. Um, unfortunately, we're at the end here. Joe, I'm going to turn it back over to you, and then uh, we'll hand it over to Tamara to, to take us off away from the table. No, I want to thank you, Will, for really a great presentation, really getting down to the root of these issues of core human values, which is really what it all boils down to. And thank you, Brian, for leading some, uh, some Q&A. I do want to uh, just maybe open it up for one moment for the floor and see if there's anyone on the call who would like to get in a, a quick uh, question before we do wrap up just to make sure everyone has a chance to speak here. Uh, Tamara, did we have any questions? I saw a few. I want to thank Robert Cardillo, by the way. He had to leave. Uh, we told him one o'clock, but uh, it was a great conversation when he was here. Um, no, the, the only questions were, were mine. And I've, I've heard some, some, some of the answers in the, in the ensuing conversation. So I don't want to hold this in. Of course, I had a specific question for Robert, but he's not here to answer it. So, <laughs> okay, no, no more pressing ones. Or, ah, let's see. Well, um, okay, I'll ask this one pressing question. It's just I always ask it because I think it's important to keep asking and to keep raising it as a concern. And that is how how do we build in representative voices into decision making processes? And so. Um, of course, Will, um, I enjoy listening to you in terms of your um, erudition, your first, uh, first principles approach, um, and, and the, the knowledge base that you bring that crosses um, barriers that um, sometimes are forgotten. But 
it's a, it's a, always a question for me, right? How do we make sure that we are having enough voices in the decision-making process um, so that we don't, we, we catch our blind spots? And so I'll throw that out to you as an ethics officer. What, what is the process? Uh, what process do you employ? And I'm presaging this to say that, and shortly thereafter, I'm kicking everybody out of the room. No, I'm, I'm going to close the room. <laughs> Right. So it's a quick answer, well, it's a, a <laughs> right. as well, if you want to. So the first thing, and this alludes to what Joseph's first question was, which was about biases. I'm an institutionalist as a bias. Like, I believe in the power of strong institutions. Uh, I'm not a big government person. Like, you know, I don't mean that in a political way. I mean that just in a human organization way. Like, I believe in strong um, institutions. Uh, so... Uh, does that make me pro-government? I don't know, but there needs to be government because in any in government in the form of a representative democracy. And so the way we do that in our model is the step two of the process, which is the categorical imperative, which is to say that if every everybody in our company, every company in our industry, every industry in the world use technology in this way, what would the world look like? So that requires us to view the entire world as our constituency. And that includes um, what people call sensitive categories or underrepresented. If the whole world is your constituency, then you need to hear all of those voices or in the form of a, or the form of a government that can represent all of those voices. Uh, and so that's how we do it in step two with the categorical imperative. Brian, do you want to add to that before we? Um... Oh, uh, yeah, I could throw a, I could throw a little spin on that. I'm going to interpret your question, Tamara, as though this issue of bias, and particularly when you're talking about AI today and machine learning, which is what we started out with. The problem with machine learning today, it's basically statistics, right? It's all about statistics, stochastic processing. And you can learn a lot from statistics. But statistics aren't the only way you learn about things. That's not the only kind of knowledge. So in that sense, anything with machine learning is already biased toward a statistical approach to solving a problem. It solves a lot of problems, totally useless on other problems. For instance, the individual gets lost because you know statistics is the bell curve. But where are the exceptional individuals who make really come in and you know make a huge difference because of their unique perspectives. Machine learning is going to filter them right out, whether it's in hiring, giving loans, or anything else. The exceptional people get get ironed out. So what we need is a kind of AI. Should, should we evolve to that? That actually can uh, uh, be based on the human perspective and be able to understand that the human perspective is both collective and diverse and be able to handle that. So that's the kind of technology we need to work for. That, that is a great way to wrap this up. I think so. Thank you very much, Brian. It gives us plenty of homework to work on and new platforms to develop. Well, Joe, I think we reinforced- Adrian did have a question. I don't know if it's too late for him or her. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to take oh. that one offline. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think we reinforced the social contract I think we moved the ball forward a little bit, uh, but it, we came at it from the human heart. And um, this is a discussion we're going to have to continue to have. So special thanks to you guys, Will and Bryant, for making the time. Uh, Robert, we'll thank him as well. It's, it's always great to hear from you. Uh, special shout out to Tamara and Matt in the SSPI team. Uh, these guys make it happen. And um, thank you again to the Luxembourg Trade and Investment Office for their support. And uh, of course, thanks to my colleague, uh, Joe, uh, on behalf of SSPI, the New York Space Alliance and our supporters, uh, best wishes for a joyful and healthy holiday season. And we'll see you next year. Remember, make it a better satellite world whenever you can. Take care, Joe. Hey, thanks, Lou. Hey, we're going to stay on a little bit. And maybe if uh, Adrian, you do want to ask that question, go right ahead. We'll, uh, we'll take it, but we'll let everyone kind of move on to the next meetings and lunch. Sounds good. Let's see, Adrian, are you still with us? I'm going to unmute Adrian if he wants to speak. Adrian, you are unmuted if you'd like to say anything. Oh, well, it, it was just a, a comment. Uh, I'm a Mexican and obviously uh, 
I'm part of a, a certain um, underrepresented minority, but uh, in, in a certain way. But uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, a social scientist, and I work in a space. Uh, and uh, but, but in a great opportunity, I have to work in, in the US um, in a program funded by, by a Greek uh, person. Uh, we have to, to study the, the roots of democracy and education in a certain way. So uh, I, I was uh, I was in thinking in this um, these uh, uh, triangle or, or, or root uh, basics of, of democracy, which is the logos, the pathos, and the ethos. You know? so the, the ethos was well uh, treated here. The logos as, as an engineer, of course, uh, but and in the pathos is, is it's an important scenario. I mean, I don't want artificial intelligence to go mad or things like that. And we also have to consider <laughs> that uh, that people needs to stay mentally health when traveling in space, you know? And uh, well, all these are case scenarios that we have to, to review. I, I work for the Mexican Space Agency, so uh, I work with people so as well. Uh, but but at the same time, it's it's part of, of the scenario that we're discussing here. I mean, I, I, I did physics and artificial intelligence as my bachelor's. So uh, I just wanted like to, to, to consider it because we can have these two opposite sides of the norm of the curve of the statistical uh, uh, path that Bryant actually mentioned. So just wanted to make that, that comment and, and I really appreciate and enjoy very very much this conversation. It was very unexpected, but uh, well, I work with satellites, I work with people, I work with uh, space, I, I work with science. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it was a very good and richful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Have a happy holiday. God bless. Thank you all. And thank you Adrian for joining for half a second and sharing your perspective. And the meeting is going to close in just a couple of seconds. Fair warning because Zoom is super abrupt.